All right. This is the very first, the very first individual episode of the Psychedelic Athlete Podcast. I am here with my guest, me, the one, the only, the one that your mom's been talking about. I'm happy to be on my own show. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thank me for having me. Yeah, I just want to do a uh, kickback sesh. I figure every 10 episodes or so. Um, well, lately my schedule has been a little weird, so I don't want to put somebody in the books that I might have to uh, not follow through with. So a lot of the episodes I've been doing, I've just been getting people out one or two days in advance. And I think it'll help my podcasting skills to be able to do solo episodes and sort of give me a little bit of character, a little personality on this thing instead of just doing like straight interviews over the internet. That was nice about having the episode that I had with Claire in person is that I got to kind of be myself and interactive and engage with, uh, you know, a woman in front of all you guys showing off my skills. Take notes, motherfuckers. Did you see how over me she was? Come on. Nah, she's gay. My mom heard that episode and she was like, She's like, wow, you and Claire really get along. You know, you, is, she, is she single? I'm like, mom, she lives in Hollywood. She goes, well, I, I, you know, I don't know. And then I'm like, mom, she's gay. She's like, yeah, but still. Um, but now it's been, it's been a good week, guys. I have some things that I kind of want to talk about, but I also just want to shoot from the hip. And just see what happens. Wing it. Um, been doing some weird shit lately. You, you guys ever hear of stomach vacuums where you like suck your stomach inward? I'll do one right now. Oh, it's been alleviating a lot of back pain that I deal with on and off. I do a good job of neutralizing my back pain and sort of spreading it out to where it doesn't. I haven't had acute back pain in a long time, but I wake up in the morning and I just can tell that I have a history of back injuries. I can just tell there's a little bit of tightness that I need to work through. I'm like that person that I'm one good warm up away from feeling great at all times. I'm rarely injured to the point where a warm up couldn't get me ready to go, but I still have that sort of thing that needs polishing off. Oh, I'll tell you what I did last Sunday and I just started doing it was my second time as we got a band going a sort of, I guess you would call it like a stoner rock, psychedelic rock, uh, jammy thing. There'll be vocals eventually. And we've jammed some with vocals, uh, some original songs I had already written and then just kind of some cover stuff. But ultimately what we've really been doing is just working on some jams and improvising. We gel together. Well, you know, my music journey, I'm going to talk about that a little bit because I think it's important to talk about. I'll, I'll share a story. There's actually, if you look up the podcast, Dizzy Street Talk, the very first episode, I talk about something that, uh, that I'm going to tell you about. I talk about the time when I first started playing guitar and singing. I put out videos of me playing guitar and singing online. Why? Because I've been playing guitar every day. Okay. I've been playing guitar every day for a few months. I'm going to share what I do. If I'm going to post something on social media almost every day, why wouldn't I share this thing I've been working on? When I'm going to wait till I'm fucking amazing to do this. I was proud of it. It is what it is. I, I sucked even worse when I started. I still sucked. And here's what it is. I like being bad at things. I really do. I'm the type of person that when I'm bad at something, like I'm really bad at hiking down steep hills, it makes me laugh. I'm really bad at walking on ice. It makes me laugh. I'm not comfortable jumping off of things. Uh, as a matter of fact, Sunday at the open mic, the guy, my, my bandmate and the other band that I'm in jumped off the stage. And then I'm like, I want to try it, but I got nervous. It made me laugh, right? So when I post a video of me singing and playing guitar and it's, and I sound tone deaf and it sounds like my, you know, I'm not keeping any rhythm or whatever. It's amusing for me. It doesn't really bother me. 
but it bothers me if it legitimately bothers other people because that makes no fucking sense. Like, how do you expect to get good at something if you're not willing to suck at something, right? It's kind of like when somebody's lost 40 pounds, but they're still 100 pounds overweight and they post a picture of themselves, they still look fat, okay? They don't, they don't look like, like, you know, um, a, a platinum album, all right? They look like an open micer at best, probably worse, okay? So, I mean, somebody's progress is, is, is somebody else's lowest point or even worse than somebody else's lowest point. We don't all start at the same spot on things. So when I started playing guitar and singing, I was so fucking bad. It's not even funny. I literally picked the instrument that was always the hardest for me to conceptualize and to understand how to learn and have like the sensitivities and, and the control for and whatever, like, like guitar is the hard was the hardest thing for me to imagine learning. I probably could have learned drums way better. I used to play the trumpet. I think I could do keyboards um, and just fiddling around. I can tell that I'm better at other instruments, but guitar is so hard. It's just, it just is very, very hard. Um, and I'm left-handed. I know I say that and some people are like, yeah, but that doesn't matter. I know, but it is an uphill battle trying to develop those sensitivities in your picking hand um, when you're not right-handed. And when I say I'm not right-handed, um, I'm so not right-handed. Like I, I can't, I am feel so weird and awkward doing anything right-handed, even things that I do for a while. Like I've been jacking off with my right hand for years and it still feels so much weirder and less coordinated than my left hand. And I mean, it's my regular jack off hand. So I'm very left-handed, good hand-eye coordination with my left hand, no coordination with my right hand. All right. So I post these videos, these hating ass motherfuckers. Well, mainly just the one Joe Robinson, this guy, Joe saw a video of me singing and playing guitar. I think his, his girlfriend, his now wife saw a video of it, shared it with him. And he's a comic. He's on 98 rock, this local show around here a lot, uh, radio show. And he has a podcast. When I was doing comedy, I was on the podcast a couple of times and um, did some shows with them, uh, comedy shows. Well, anyway, Joe goes on this long spiel on his podcast. Oh, Mike Turpin, this comp comedian, he's actually been on the show. He posts these videos. It is so fucking bad. Like, I can't tell if it's a joke. I can't tell if it's a put on. He was trying to say that it was like a, a, a parody, like I was being like an Andy Kaufman. Like I was spoofing. It was so bad that he thought it had to be a joke. So anyway, I found out about this, of course. I wound up calling him on my way to the weigh-ins to a fight. I made 205, all right? I wound up stepping in the cage at 230. So that was a serious fucking weight cut. And I had already cut the weight. I cut the weight and then drove all the way, like over two hours to the fight by myself. So I didn't even tell him that that was the state I am when I, that was in when I called him. We called him and I, I laid it out for him. I essentially gave him the dude, you know, you ought to get a fucking, you're lucky I don't smack you in your fucking mouth. Or I said something along those lines. Cause he just went on and on about how shitty it was. I'm like, you didn't say anything good about me. You didn't say that we were friends. You didn't say that you understood. There was no, like, there was no positive spin, no, nothing. Just a hating ass motherfucker. And it's like, you know, I do suck at this. You may even be better at me having never done it. But at the end of the day, it's about, when it comes to me, it's not about how good I am at something. I shared my very first jujitsu matches. I shared my very first comedy sets. I remember one time I bombed so hard in comedy. I was so excited to share how bad of a set I had. I mean, it was, it was just, I can, it was the worst set I've ever had in my entire life times like 20. I had a friend who was there laughing at my jokes and somebody in the audience looked at them and they're like, why are you laughing? Okay. That's how bad it was. Just was not, it was not my crowd and the jokes at the time. And it was weird. 
doesn't matter for those of you who are local, the, the, the show was in Cecil County. That's not an excuse, but you could imagine the types of sarcastic comments I was making. And I was doing a lot of like weirder kind of absurd over the top one liner stuff. And they took me pretty literally. Um, it just didn't gel. And then once you create that dynamic, you sort of play off of that and become their enemy. Well, anyway, all that being said, I chewed fucking Joe out, gotten his shit, blah, 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 blah. That's how bad I was in the beginning, though. I was so bad at, at playing guitar that a guy who had a, a podcast thought it was so worth bringing up and spending like 10 minutes talking about it on his podcast. That's how bad it was. Imagine if I was just like on this, oh my God, by the way, I was looking at Facebook the other day and this guy, Joe Robinson, he posted this. You see what I mean? It's like, it was, that's the level it brought me to. And I was a little on edge being through that weight cut. But on the very first episode of Dizzy Street Talk, it was a podcast I, I did with a guy, Steve Paul Hammer, um, a guy I used to work with and went to school with. Anyway, the very first episode, we play clips from their podcast, and then we give our sort of thing. And then there was even, they talked about it again after I called Joe and brought it up. So that's how bad I was in the beginning. And it is amazing to get good enough to the point where at least people who listen to the kind of music that I'm into and play music, they recognize some good things about what I'm doing when I play guitar, especially like kind of distorted, heavier, that sort of, um, you know, that sort of uh, genre. They, they enjoy what I'm doing or, or they have good things to say. And people are into sort of weirder types of music. I mean, the whole singer, songwriter, acoustic, clean vocals, all that that's probably never going to be my thing, but I like people who I, there's never been a singer that I hear and don't like them because they're a bad singer. As long as they seem cool and it seems important to them and it seems sincere. If I like, if I like where it's resonating from, I really like it. And as a matter of fact, I find that, that musicians that lean heavily on their singing ability I don't connect to where it's resonating as well. I'm not saying it's fake, but I just don't connect to it as well. So, you know, that kind of gives you a little whatever, but we were jamming and it was, it was awesome, dude. It sounded so, I mean, to us, it sounded good. The, the one guy's kid didn't care for it as much, but fuck him. He's a little brat. Um, so that, that was fun. That's cool to, to progress. It would be fun to do. I mean, even if you just skip around, you got to listen to the whole fucking thing. It would be fun to do just like a, a podcast jam one time. I was shocked how the audio quality sounded just recording it on my phone. As a matter of fact, let me see if I can just, I'm going to pull up this uh, link and see if I can, I'll play a little actually while I'm thinking about it. See what I can do. It's going to sound worse because it's playing through my phone into the, into the uh, microphone, but let's just play like, like, like a, you know, 30 seconds, a minute. Of so we got Jose, a guy I do jujitsu with, and his buddy, John, who also does jujitsu. Uh, he's on drums. I'm on guitar. We'll let it roll out a minute. There's only like a minute. There's less than a minute left. I have no idea how this sounds to you as far as through the microphone, but...
cool. So that gave you a little bit of taste of what we were doing and something I had, well, might have given you taste. I don't know how it fucking came out, but uh, that, that was a lot of fun. So we're practicing again in a couple of days. And it, yeah, it's nice to kind of put your effort into something that you want to get good at, not worry too much about sucking, be willing to kind of give a confident middle finger to any naysayers, any hate ass motherfuckers you have and let them know, bro, you come in my person with that kind of shit. I'm going to smack you across your fucking mouth. I told him, I actually told him something about like, uh, I told him something about just like, if you're willing to say that kind of stuff about me to anybody and, and just like act like, you know, talk about me like that, I might as well as just tell you, Hey, you know, tell your, tell your wife or tell your girl, well, she was fiance at the time, you know, she can, she can get it if she wants it, dude. She probably fucking wants it to like, tell her to fucking bend over. Let me fucking write your name on her ass with my cum. I did say something like that. So yeah, I take things pretty far like that. When people deserve to, when I know that somebody deserves a little bit of something, I give them a lot of it of something. And I kind of let them know that I'm willing to take it as far as they want to take it. And they have temporarily made themselves the enemy. And I will stand up to them in any fucking way that I want. And there's nothing they can do about it. And I like beating people at their own game. So if people talk shit, I'm not really going to smack the guy in his face. Although I probably like a little smack wouldn't be a big deal. If he wants to fight me over a smack, then I'll kick his ass. I'm not going to kick somebody's ass who doesn't want to kick my ass, but I might give a dude a little smack more, more to humiliate him than to actually physically bully him or dominate him or use my ability to fight over him. Um, I kind of see it like that. And people who know me, some people are like, dude, you know, you seem like such a nice guy. And it's like, yeah, maybe, but you got to really see me when I, when I lose my shit or when I, when I put somebody in their place, but I rarely regret it. I don't know if that's necessarily better or worse. Usually I'm pretty happy about the way I handle my shit. Hmm. Drinking a seltzer water here. I love seltzer water. Took a little while to get used to it. Like when I first started drinking seltzer, it tasted so terrible. I was dating, I was dating a girl who drank it and I had switched. I had cut out diet soda. Cause up until I was like maybe 25, 26, I drank a shitload of diet soda. And when I stopped diet soda, I was drinking water with lemon, but she had seltzer water. And I remember like, maybe I drank like three or four cans, but by like the fourth can, I was like, okay, I'm starting to like this. And I've been hooked ever since. I don't understand it. The only ingredient is, is natural flavors. It's just water and natural flavors. There's no like weird chemical. There's nothing, there's no, there's no anything. There's no, there's no calories, no sodium. And it's just natural flavors, carbonated water and natural flavor. Huh? Well, what the hell are that? What's the hell is that natural flavor? Is that just like secret shit? Why don't they have to say what natural flavor is? I got asked a couple things to talk about. I mentioned that I was going to be doing this podcast. One person hit me up wanting me to talk about if I had any views on training, like martial arts training across the world, differences between the training here in the States and other areas. Well, I do have a little bit of firsthand experience with that. I did do some training in Japan. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's probably as simple as looking at their culture plus the specific sports that they do and then imagining how that would combine. And what I mean by that is Japanese, you know, there was a lot of people who were really good at judo. So the types of things involved in judo, the, the, the side pinning, a lot of the wrestling was more judo like than wrestling. Like in the gi, there was a lot of people trying to hit throws. And then when you look at Japanese people as a culture, you could probably recognize a bit more discipline 
They drilled things very, very dutifully. Um, everybody of every rank drilled things. They are, they definitely, you know, there's not a whole lot of fear in their training. You know, they, they drill things pretty hard, not a lot of complaining. And they have a lot of pride when it comes to their training and, and their, their work. Um, I picked that up definitely in Japan. And then they're a country that's, you know, as a, as a people, they're pretty mobile. And you could definitely tell that you were dealing with very, very mobile hips. Trying to pass their guard was insane. And they definitely had, I saw a little bit, I felt like Godzilla, the way they wanted to challenge themselves against me because I was just this big, strong dude coming in from the States. You know, they don't get a whole, this wasn't in Tokyo. This was in a city uh, called Kyoto. So they don't get a whole lot of American people in there. And if they do, not many of them are, you know, a super heavyweight well over six feet. They don't, they don't get a lot of that. So they were very much like, here is this big, strong guy that I get to try to beat. It actually was pretty scary because I don't think they realized that it was remotely risky. They thought they were probably being very, very conscientious or, or safe in a way, but God, I, I remember turtling up and playing like turtle position and, and a couple guys like the, the one black belt who, who runs it had me in a Kimura grip and he was just throwing his whole body into it. Every time we rolled, cause I went to the gym, I guess, I don't know, not quite a handful of times, but at least three, at least three times, probably four times. And he would throw his whole body into trying to break my Kimura grip because I'm just this big, strong guy. And apparently, you know, it's just kind of like, you're not going to hurt me is probably what he was thinking that, that I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to get injured, of course. So it was kind of scary. Um, yeah. And when I, when I hear things or look at people, like I have trained with people who are from Russia, I don't know if they started training in Russia, but there's a difference about the way they are. They have a different sort of toughness about them and kind of projection of hardness and, and a different attitude about them. But I mean, even here within the States, there's such a difference between East Coast and West Coast and cold areas versus warm areas. So like where I'm at, Maryland specifically is not necessarily known for its wrestling, but, but only, I mean, you know, 30 minutes up the road into PA, you got some amazing, amazing um, towns known for their wrestling and then New Jersey. And I compete a lot in Philly and I've, and I've competed in Jersey. And those are some, those are two of the best wrestling States. So you get a lot of strong, tough wrestlers. Um, and then if you go to the West coast, I've never trained in the West coast, but I've trained with a lot of people from the West coast. And I've trained with a lot of people who've trained in the West coast. You get a totally different game. So just the culture within the States is reflective of the cities and areas that you're training in. And that's going to be the same anywhere. I've never, I've never trained with anybody from Dagestan, right? But it's pretty simple to tell, okay, they're a wrestling dominant area. They drill things to no end. They're tough. They have a tough life. And they're going to have a different game because of it, that they have that strong grappling base that a lot of jujitsu people do not have. So even, and then you go within the styles, it's like, it's some MMA gyms, we're, we're bang Muay Thai. So the Muay Thai at my gym is not the Muay Thai that I've gotten going to, um, I, I trained with a super heavyweight for my last fight, Joe Stripling, uh, because it was nice to work with a guy who was huge. And he was uh, very high ranked in Muay Thai and is very accoladed in Muay Thai, goes and trains overseas. And I've seen him, I saw him fight MMA. I was like, oh my God, I got to train with that guy. So I went up there and did some one-on-ones with him. It clicked. And then I was going up there every week, at least every week for, for a fight camp, but sometimes twice a week. And 
it, it was very, very different. It was a very different mentality. It was a very different style than, than even the Muay Thai we were doing, which is still Muay Thai, very MMA based. And, you know, Bang Muay Thai is one of the best systems around. It's, it's one of the hot, most highly respected striking systems um, there, there are. And what, Eddie, the owner of Method, is a black shirt in Bang Muay Thai, which is not very common. There are not many black shirts in Bang Muay Thai walking around, but it's very different. And originally we had more of a boxing base. So it was like boxing with kicks, knees, elbows added in, distancing that was more um, related to MMA distancing, which is an even further distance than Muay Thai, which is an even further distance than boxing. Um, so there was a lot of, a lot of awareness of wrestling within your boxing and then kicks, knees and elbows added in and peppered in, but a lot of people sparring, a lot of us keep it to punching and, and some of us just keep it to punching and kicking. And it's a few group of people that, that full spar, uh, knees and elbows in the gym. And then some of the culture just changes gym to gym. So there might be people that have an attitude that is reflective of different countries or different influences and different lineages. If you go up the street and train at a, at a Helsin Gracie affiliated school, it's going to be very different than training at some school where the guy who owns it is a wrestler, right? Um, or, or whatever comes from somewhere else. I have trained with a lot of guys who are, who learned in Brazil. And I think a lot of the Brazilians do drill specifically certain things a lot that they like to do. Um, but they also have a lot of freedom person to person. Now that might not be indicative of every system there, but, but the Brazilians, there's a lot of individuality. When you, when you look at people across the, like, like the United States, you get so much individuality, city to city, state to state, um, uh, person to person, preference to preference. The people in Japan, they all trained like each other. And there are systems like Gracie Baja where they want you to all do the same sort of things. And there are, like there's a gym near here, uh, form jujitsu. And it seems like a lot of their people, if you go for like something, they all defend it the same way. They've learned a lot of the same system and they all grapple like each other. Uh, TLI team Lloyd Irvin is one that they all embody a lot of similar things method. The gym I'm at, we are, it's totally individual. Uh, there are like little pockets of these people kind of grapple like th the others and have learned from each other, but man, we do not look the same as the other people at the gym. We have a lot of unique styles. I think that's actually one thing that makes my gym probably uh, stand out to me more than any other gym. If you took our top 30 people and had them all on the same mat, and you were to just bring some people from outside gyms in, they would probably be shocked at the variety of styles and, and, and sort of games. Whereas some gyms you go to and you realize, oh, this gym, like, like one gym I cross train at, they do a lot of single leg X. Um, some gyms you go to, they do a lot of the same passes, a lot of the same whatever. We have individual instructors that, that have go-to passes that they teach or, or go-to styles that they teach. Some just more, more so fundamental blueprints. Some kind of teach whatever, just mix it up. Um, you know, we have a CSW influence, which is Eric Paulson. Uh, originally, we were CSW when I first started and then became affiliated with Danny Suarez of SoCal Combat, who's under Chris Howder. And Chris Howder has some affiliation with like Hicks and, and, and also has his own kind of thing going on. And if you know any of anything about him, he's one of the dirty dozen, I think. And one of the original big heads in American um, jujitsu. So it's, we have a big mix of styles, a lot of influence coming in. And because we, we have West coast affiliations on an East coast school, we also have a lot of freedom as well. Um, as far as our system goes, it's not like a, as much direct 
uh, sort of coaching as some schools get being affiliated or having like the system either being at the main headquarters or whatever, or even like a 10th planet. That's very, very Eddie Bravo influence. They actually have like the same, I don't know how each individual school does it. And as they've franchised out more and more, it probably is less and less similar school to school but they have a lot of specific things that they all have to learn. They like have the exact 10th planet warmups. I can't say every gym does it. I don't know that for sure, but regardless, the curriculum is, is set. Now bang Muay Thai is like that. There's individuality, but bang Muay Thai looks like bang Muay Thai. It is bang Muay Thai. It is only bang Muay Thai. And yeah, you might pepper in some of your own stuff and some of your own concepts, but for the most part, you're drilling bang Muay Thai. I mean, it's an endless list of, of, of combos and things to, to practice. It's not like it's limited to like 10 things, but you're pretty much pulling from the bang Muay Thai system. So that just gives you an idea like, yeah, you could break down Brazilians are more like this. Japanese are more like this. Uh, you know, Africans have a bigger dick. You can break it down like that. Of course, but it's so more than that. And, and I'd say it's probably, I would imagine that's somewhat unique, somewhat unique to the States, somewhat unique to the States, as far as the variety just within the U S is so much. And you see some of the influence from all over the globe in stateside schools that you can sort of get a taste of that without traveling outside of the U S now, taking a step away from actual jujitsu, MMA, all that, I, I originally I wasn't even sure if the person meant strength and conditioning. There are a lot of differences when it comes to strength and conditioning across across the globe and methods and training protocol. And you know, you really do see a lot of American people that that do the West Side training, that do the uh, five by five training. Um, the types of accessory lifts they do. It's not as simple as saying, you know, a Romanian deadlift is done specifically in this part of the world. But uh, yeah, there is a lot of, a lot of things that you notice area to area, the amount of volume, you know, but, but anymore, I think the internet kind of ruined a lot of that. I mean, ruined it, but it, but it kind of became a thing of the past. I would say pre, pre like heart of the internet, there was more, oh, it was so obvious what the Russians were doing compared to the, the U S compared to, um, Iranian, uh, weightlifting compared to X, Y, Z. And yeah, there were like, there are areas where they teach you how to Olympic weightlift in, in elementary school, the Russians, as far as I know, um, and other countries do this as well. They'll, they'll do things like compare your femur to shin ratio. And if you have long femurs, they won't put you into weightlifting. They'll put you into something else or, or whatever. Like they funnel people into sports for different reasons and they will, they will start you off young and it will be a part of your school. Um, I knew a guy from Italy, I actually dated a, a, a Mexican girl who worked at a pizza shop, she didn't speak any English and I don't speak any Spanish. So that was interesting. But the guy who owned the pizza shop she worked at was Italian. And uh, he said that he learned how to do weightlifting, like starting off at the way beginning of school with like a broomstick that they would, they would teach you how to do the clean, the snatch and the jerk, like at like six or seven. I don't know how common that is in Italy, but that's common in certain schools. We had a guy that used to train with us named Choi that was Korean, did a lot of his martial arts in Korea and moved here as, a, as an older adult. And he had done some stuff and different stuff. He had grappling experience and whatever, but when he was younger, he spent large amounts of time doing Taekwondo. He was in like school for Taekwondo. As far as I could understand, like six days a week, long hours of the day was built around Taekwondo. And this is even through youth. 
So he did other things, but it pretty much revolved around that. So it's not like he was just doing Taekwondo, but it would be sectioned off where they would learn things like maybe Tai Chi, um, meditation stuff, weathering and building up uh, conditioning of the shins. Um, then you would drill some stuff, you know, wh whatever. They did a lot of things that, that, that built to a bigger picture to be better at Taekwondo, but that, that's pretty much what he did. So we don't have a whole lot of that here. I mean, yeah, you can take a high school sport. You can do wrestling in school. And maybe some schools have clubs. And I don't know if there's any way to do karate as a part of a school program. But yeah, and, and we joke around a lot more in the States. A lot of schools are pretty lax with like not showing up on time. That's probably somewhat of the Brazilian influence as well. Um, and it's different school to school and it's different person to person. You know, if you're a white belt showing up late, it might look different than someone else showing up late. And it depends on the reasons you're showing up late. If you're showing up late because you get off from work late or, you know, you got a busy life, you got a family and kids, people might not care. They don't care if you jump in, in the middle of class, they don't care if you just show up after class to roll, right? That that's different school to school. But it might be different if you start off that way or if you got no good reason and you're just habitually late and lazy and try and skip out on stuff. So I think jujitsu, I see a lot of personalized, like we treat you as individuals and we all we have different different rules for different people. I, I feel a lot of that as I travel in jujitsu gyms. Um, the strength, yeah, I was going to go into a little bit about the differences, but to be honest, it's like anymore, there's like, you know, the origin of where it came from, but I think it's just kind of a melting pot. The entire globe has become a training melting pot if you have access to the internet and different literature and uh, the, the famous people are the famous people. So I was going to talk a little bit about on that, but no, I would think that that it's pretty easy to, to, to connect the dots to the culture and the training. And it, and it just makes sense. A, a duck is going to walk like a duck, quack like a duck. So a, a Japanese guy doing a sport is going to seem like a Japanese motherfucker doing the sport. Now, you can take that and run with it all you want or take it nowhere. But I mean, it's just the way it is. Girl's going to cry when she loses a jiu-jitsu match more often than a dude. And a Japanese guy is going to pray to his heritage more often when he steps on his mat than I am. Okay. Doesn't mean I'm not going to do both, but yeah, there are norms and I notice them and recognize them, but they're, they're in constant flux and they change. So it, it's just, you know, you take the median of what you've been exposed to and what you've heard and more than likely, you could pretty easily figure out what it's like across the globe. I got asked by somebody to describe, it was a joke. Ha ha ha, Ryan, very funny to describe gay sex with men. I wasn't going to do this. I actually have some insight on gay sex. No, kidding. But I will tell you this, man. I have something just a little bit about gay sex. I've always thought it was odd that just because you're gay, like, okay, what if you don't like anal sex, maybe giving or receiving? Like, I've always wondered what percent of gay couples participate in anal sex, and then what percent of individuals both receive and give? I know sometimes there's a taker and a giver, but how common is it? Because I, what if what if I like a guy? What if I want to live with a guy? What if I want to love a guy? What if I want to make out with a guy? What if I want to be jerked off and jerk off a dude or have my dick sucked by a dude and maybe suck his dick? Don't judge me. But what if I want to? But what if I'm just like, you know, dude, I'm not really into butt stuff. Because to be honest, I'm not really into butt stuff with women that much. I've, I've gotten a little bit more okay with it. Um, you know, one of the more recent girls I dated 
was into it and it was the most regular butt stuff I had ever done in my life. I mean, I like licking ass and all, but as far as like sticking my dick way up there and go investigating like deep into your butt, like, I don't know what you have four and a half inches up your butt. Okay. You know, I, it's, it's a little gross. It's still a little gross. I get nervous every time I pull it out. Like, is there going to be some shit on me? Is it going to look kind of weird? Sometimes there's like, it's not shit, but it's like slimy and like kind of yellowish. And then sometimes there will just be like a little piece of poop. It's less than you would expect. If I was to stick my finger up my butt, I would get more poop on there than I would get with the average anal sex interaction. I don't know if maybe the lube kind of like keeps it from getting stuck to your dick. Um, you know, because the last time I was doing it, I lubed it up before every time. Um, but I was with the, my first experience with anal sex. That chick was just like, throw it in there. She liked it. And I did not like it. It was just kind of something about it was, it was just so gross to me back then. And I would just pretend that I liked it. And then it would like kind of make me go limp. And then I would pretend that I came. Ugh. fucking I, yeah, I'm not a big fan of anal sex, but I have grown to like it more. I also don't like the look of a butthole that's had a lot of anal sex. There's a look. You just know you're looking at a butt that, that gets rammed. It kind of just gets a little haggard, gets a little thicker, a little rougher. It's got a deeper voice. It's got a rasp to it. It's not pretty. It's not a nice little pretty tiny, tiny pristine butt actually making small penis jokes this morning i said it's actually perfect to be kind of mid-sized because like you know maybe a girl doesn't want to be destroyed maybe she doesn't want you to ruin her vagina for the rest of her life just be wrecked and destroyed because you had this gargantuan penis you know i'm in the pussy preservation club so that was my bit on gay sex yeah, I just don't know. I don't know. Like, cause it would, the stars would kind of have to align. Like, okay, I'm a gay guy. You're a gay guy. I'm into you. Oh shit. You don't like taking it up the ass. Well, neither do I. So what do we just suck each other's dicks? You know, what do we just like jerk off next to each other? Just kiss a lot. Do we have an open relationship? It would just be interesting. It would just be interesting to, to handle that. And then what if, you know, we both are givers or we're both receivers. We don't like giving it because maybe you like taking it up your ass, but you don't like putting it in somebody else's ass. That could be, that could be possible. I mean, you know, it's just one of those things. And then how soon do you talk about that? Cause, cause it would suck if you're like, you know, if a few dates in really vibing and then you're like, all right, so what, what are you into sexually? And then I know everyone's got their kinks, but see, I, it's just a different level of like, like chemistry. It's, it's a very specific thing that you do when you're gay that you may or may not be into. And it, and I always saw it like, is it just, kind of normal for dudes to want to do that to each other or have that done to them if they're into dudes. So that's my, it's my section on gay sex. I got asked to talk about some other things, but might save it for a future solo episode. Um, yeah, I'm gonna drink a little bit more of this seltzer water. I'm going to get nice and close to the microphone. Usually they like to say it's bad to like drink and chew and do things on the mic, but I don't know if gulping and being able to remember when you used to do this to bottles hold on oh my dog just fucking lit up very confused give it up for connor everybody connor on the reaction that you can't see or hear but he did he is here um one sec That's something about having a guest. You can just kind of like drink something while they're talking. It's not as big of a deal. I don't ever hear like Joey Diaz drink on his solo podcast. 
I'll talk about that. You know, it's weird just talking to yourself. The first few minutes of this, I felt a little uncomfortable. Now I'm feeling better. I think next time I need a list. Next time I'm just going to, like, if I know I'm going to do a solo episode, I'm just going to have a, a Word document of things to touch on. Because I didn't have anything like that planned. Um, I knew the questions I got asked. I got asked uh, five things. Two of them were the same thing. I didn't feel like talking about psychedelics on this episode. So I got asked about that twice. I answered two of the other things. And uh, one of them I answered in a message. I didn't think it would really be necessarily worth talking about. Oh, someone asked me about my dating life. They said it would be fun to hear me talk about, you know, like they liked when people brought up their dating stuff. I guess I'll talk about that. I kind of talked about it when Claire was on but I shouldn't assume that you listen to every episode. That's something I'm self-conscious about that I just need to not worry about. I don't give a fuck when people repeat themselves on podcasts. I've heard the same story like 10, 15 times. If you listen to every episode of Joey Diaz or you know Tiger Belly with Bobby Lee or, or Theo Vaughn or Joe Rogan, if you listen to these people, I mean, God, they tell the same story so many times and it just never bothers me. I listened to a lifting podcast with Marty Gallagher and he tells so many of the same anecdotes over and over. And I find it kind of endearing. I like it. So I shouldn't be afraid to say the same sort of things. This is the least I've dated in my life. You know, the last relationship I got out of was right at the beginning of COVID. And I just took it upon myself to get really focused on what I was doing. And I just filled my schedule to the nine and I didn't worry about dating. I didn't worry about anything related to dating. And I just haven't really put myself in a situation to date since then. I was going out with a girl for, you know, a couple months and we hung out some and it progressed some but it never really took off. And then she moved deeper into the city and we still hit each other up some. And, you know, we've hung out like once in a blue moon, essentially. And uh, I got, I got like a couple like flirty things going on. And I just, you know, five years ago, six years ago, if I had any remote like flirtiness with a girl, I would have jumped all over it. If I thought they were hot and cool, I would have like, you know, been all about trying to find a way to go out with them, go on a date. But I just don't really have the drive or the energy to care about that if it, if it doesn't seem great and or easy. Like, yeah, I wouldn't mind something casual. That sounds great. But I'm not like going out looking for it. And I'm not going to be the one to be like, starting flirting and and trying to get the dominoes to fall in accordance to that so i ain't had anybody knocking up my door trying to send me naked pictures and make it obvious what the hell they're looking for so because of that i haven't really bit on that and i also haven't had anybody that i really want to date date and and you know sacrifice a lot of my life for so i haven't really pursued anybody relationship wise and it's the first time in my life I've gone this long without any regular casual dating or any sustainable relationship sort of dating. And it's the most independent I've ever felt. It's very empowering. It's very cool. I like it. But I know that once I start up again, getting laid, I'm going to be like, oh, dude, you were such an idiot for not giving a fuck about this for fucking two years. Are you crazy? you pretty much went a year with like getting laid twice. Like what is wrong with you? I mean, I think I'm going to look back on this and say that part of me was stupid, but it is nice to not feel dependent, to not have any codependency. It's very hard. I think a lot of us are very codependent. We like require some sort of something when it comes to relationships. And I see it in other people now. I see it when they get single like how hard it is for them to be single. And it's nothing for me to be single right now. Very, very comfortable. It's the first time I've been this comfortable being single and not 
pursuing anything. Would I like something? I mean, yeah, at the very least, it would be nice to have some chick that I enjoy hooking up with and enjoy their time and enjoy hanging out with them. Um, and we don't expect it to go anywhere like a regular thing like that. Yeah. I would like that. That seems like a better idea and cooler to me than just like random hookups where it's like, yeah, we're hanging out. We're doing the whole sex thing. We eat some food. We watch a movie. We enjoy each other's time. We text here and there make each other laugh, but we're not trying to marry each other for whatever reason. That would be nice. That would be nice. So I would say hopefully something like that happens within the next three, four months. Um, and I'm always open to, to finding the one. I'm always open to that idea. Uh, I'm always open to finding my next thing, but you know, the more times you've fallen in love or the more times you've had relationships, you can't step back. You can't downgrade the connection you have. It needs to sort of surpass anything you've ever felt. I think that. So when I'm looking for what I'm looking for in a relationship is something that can totally wipe the slate clean of any sort of connections I've had to past relationships. And I've done a good job with that in my relationships. Each relationship has been very good at feeling like you know, fulfilled as far as not reminding me or longing for anything in my history. And when you go out with people that you don't connect with and you don't vibe with, it's so easy to sort of wish it was more like your relationships used to be. That's like kind of like bad dating for me. It's like, this is just, it feels so less complete and so less good. And the fact that we honestly are trying to think that we might eventually be each other's plus one and ride off into the sunset is just ludicrous. There's no way. We are fooling ourselves. So that's where I'm at on dating. And that's probably where I'm at on this individual podcast. I don't want to talk at you for fucking ever. This is long enough talked about enough bullshit. So maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll start just taking notes and just jotting down things to talk about. And then that way, the next time I do an individual one, I got some cool shit, maybe some stories, or if anybody listens to this, feel free to, to say some things you want to hear. I do have some interesting guests that I need to schedule, but like I said, I just haven't been trying to schedule too much. So unless it's like a last minute thing, I'm going to get James Fuller back on uh, here in the next week or two. I got a buddy with a very interesting story. One of my best friends from youth, we worked together. Um, one of my original MMA friends, as far as like we watched MMA all the time together. He had a crazy life changing thing happen. And uh, wound up doing some time. And it's an interesting story. And he's willing to tell it on the podcast. I want to get him on. I have a couple other buddies that I know through here. A couple psychedelic people who want to come on. I'm going to get David Weck on of Weck Method. The creator of the BOSU ball and the pro pulsers and rope flow. Very fascinating guy. And the core fist. So he's going to be on. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Thank you for listening. As always, let me know what you think. Instagram is probably the easiest place to hit me up, but cool. Thank you.